All right, guys, welcome to the afternoon already. We're going to start with the first talk with uh, Roger Duder. He uh, did, does already web or specifically front end development for over 10 years. He's co is the founder of Frontify, was also last year already here at the conference with this great talk. Hope you enjoy it. Hi, so hopefully you had a, g a great lunch. Um, first of all, I want to thank uh, Angelo, Matthias, and all the other great guys who are making this conference happen. So it's uh, a really great way for Switzerland to catch up on front-end technologies. You know, we, we, need, to, we need to be uh, on stage all the time. So, um, yeah, I'm happy to be here again. Uh, last year, I had a talk about collaboration between uh, designers and developers, and gave me very good response, so um, hopefully I can give you something to take home today. And yeah, let's start. So my talk is called Building the Web in 2018. When I told someone this title, he was thinking, oh, you're giving a future talk. That's probably a hard thing. So you might want to choose another topic. So, but I, I think it's a cool thing because there's so, so much going on. And, if you go to a conference, it's really cool to, to catch up and to get to know what's happening currently, what are the trends, what, which visions are there. I think today I can give you a good compilation of new trends and tools um, which you can actually use today or even in a few years. If you've read my abstract from the talk, you, uh, you might have seen the last sentence which was called, I'll bring the DeLorean and you the talent. So here's the DeLorean, and here's the talent. So I think we're ready to start. This one you can actually buy it <laughs> from Lego. <laughs> um, yeah, my name is Roger. Um, I'm living in a beautiful city of St. Gallen next to the Lake of Constance. And I'm a developer and designer by heart. So I try to do both, but I'm, I'm better at developing than designing. Um, I previously worked at Namix as a software engineer. Uh, which is uh, one of the largest Swiss uh, internet agencies. And now I'm, I'm the founder of Frontify, which is a, a company totally dedicated to front-end development. Yeah, now as you're here, I'm going to start my sales talk about 30 minutes. So, <laughs> no, I, I'm not going to talk about my product. Um, but um, if you want to check it out, it's about style guides, it's about generating style guides, it's about uh, delivering designs to developers. So if you want to check it out, frontify.com. Okay, why have I chosen 2018 and not 2016 or 2020? I was thinking about 2016, well, might be a little too early, you might remember what I said and so uh, you can come back and say, hey, what this guy told me it was totally bullshit. Um, so I went a li little more far away, and, but I think 2020 is a bit too far away for you um, to really get something that you can use in your daily business and you've been really prepared to. First, I want to have a look back how, uh, about predictions. Um, um, an illustrator from France tried to predict the future in 1910, um, and he tried to, to see what what was happening in the year 2000. <laughs> they were really into flying. <laughs> so uh, he thought that we will have so much air traffic that we need policemen to you know, regulate all that stuff. Flying firefighters. I, I love this jetpack stuff, so why not give them to them? They also predicted drones there. And they were also thinking about making things more efficient, automating things. So what about the house building machine? Or the makeup machine? I think this one is really good for the women in here, but uh, would be also a time saver for us, you know? 
Okay, and now um, I'm not going to predict something really, you know, uh, really visionary in terms of uh, flying stuff and whatever. I really try to make it make it um, a little bit more real uh, to to show you things you can use today. Uh, you can, yeah, you can think of today. According to the Guardian, in the next 25 years, it's not. It, it's more like you guys and me uh, who are trying to change the future and uh, try to have an impact on what's happening because technology is so so close you can you can you can build hardware and software so easily and cheap so we really it really goes into a direction where it becomes it becomes hard to to predict what's happening so in surveys I, I, I had a look at, I, I saw that people in 2004 were very much more um, into one topic or another. They, they could decide way easier what's going to happen and what not. And today it's way harder. So I decided to make three categories of, of, um, of these predictions. The hot topics which are actually here or are coming in next year. Then a trend, which is um, something that becomes mainstream probably in one to three years. And visions, which are more like ideas, um, probably they happen, probably not. One of the hottest topics, I think, currently is the real-time web. So you can, see it, you can see it everywhere currently, but mostly in applications. But I think it goes beyond applications. It's also in, in, in websites, in, in corporate websites, even there. Um, you have to think about, in every new project, you have to think about what needs to be real time. Everyone is expecting that when he looks at something, it needs to be real time. It needs to be up to date every time. So this brings in some new challenges, especially technical challenges. and. To help you, um, there are some other guys, clever guys out there who help you to, to get started really fast. So when it comes to real time, what is something that comes in mind uh, in a second? It's Node.js and Socket.io, for example. But if you don't want to struggle around with those technologies, you can try to use something that's already existing. For example, Meteor. That's uh, a framework which allows you to build really real-time applications. Uh, in, in no time. And I don't dig in, in too deep in, in those, in those uh, different applications I show you, but what I want to tell you is that, for example, you can see this number down here, it's $11 million, and that's what they got as funding. So this is really serious business, and that's a huge change, I think, because um, in the earlier days we had some super cool open source projects uh, who do awesome stuff and but they you know you don't really have to um, stick on them because they can disappear in just a year or something and now it's really happening that investors even think that's a good thing and so if the companies have that much money they will do something really really serious another application that's here is pusher and pusher is something, if you already have an application um, which you want to make real time, it allows you to just use their service to connect your application and make it real time. So an application that allows you to send messages and the applications consume them. So it's really an easy way to get things started, to jump into the topic. And not only for for applications itself, so the core of the application, it's important to have it real time. It's also important to think about those, those things that are around the application. So for example, customer relationship management. Intercom actually uses Pusher as their backend. And it's a tool which allows you to send messages to your application directly in form of notifications or messages or whatever based on different options, different parameters and lets your user feel um, like supported in real time. That's a cool thing and really easy to use. 
Another trend I've seen is, um, well, the word BAAS doesn't really exist. I've tried to, you know, there is the word SaaS, which is probably a software as a service. And I think uh, that uh, describes as good, it's backend as a service. There are companies who are trying to, um, to help you by abstracting the whole backend thing. So Firebase, for example, allows you to just build your front end and use them as your back end. So you don't have to care about the scale, you don't have to care about the storage, you don't have to care about the infrastructure in general. So you can just drop in and use their service to build something. Maybe sometimes it's a, it's a really good way to, um, to get to know more about your application and how it behaves. So maybe later you can jump to your own infrastructure. But to get started, I think it's a really cool thing. Another one is Parse. Parse is pretty much the same thing, but focused on mobile. So they also allow you to send push messages and stuff like that. They really take care about the whole infrastructure around your application, especially on mobile. And they got acquired by Facebook in April this year. So this is, this is really serious stuff happening currently. Another one you, you might have heard of is Web Components. Um, web Components is driven forward by, com by large companies like Google and is a new way of, of handling modules and components in the web. So I don't want to dig too deep into Web Components in general, but what you need to know is that there is a movement there and it will come and it will allow you to create custom elements. So you will create your own elements and you will have templates which you can reuse. Really cool stuff coming. If you want to check it out, there is Polymer Project, an initiative from Google, which allows you to test those web components. That's a library based, based on web components. Or Mozilla Brick. Uh, the same from Mozilla, so <laughs> they're trying to do the same all the time. But
we are doing. So we can automatically suggest the next element we're trying to create. Um, it can easily allow you to change styles and stuff like that. I'm not sure, it's just an inspirational thing. In browser development, um, that's not really development, but uh, Tridiff is a really cool application where you can model 3D in your browser. So it's not anymore not possible to create really comprehensive applications in your browser that are performant, that are working really well. So what I see is that we're really driving into the a direction where we where there will be way more ways to develop things in the browser. Because it's really easy to create your own editor, like a CodePen, for example, um, with frameworks like CodeMirror or Ace. It's so easy to create an editor. So in the future, I think there will be way more editors for every kind of thing. There it comes to the perfect ID, something I'm sometimes dreaming of. <laughs> Um, you probably know Lighttable. That's a Kickstarter project. Um, it, it got funded and it's in development. And it's, it's a tool which allows you to create your own blocks um, of code that can be like a HTML snippet, a CSS snippet, a JS snippet. And if we combine that with, for example, a preview and a box with specifications, and something, maybe a JSON file, which shows the request and the response that's going back and forth, we can create custom development environments that are really, really for our use case. And they are perfect for what we do all day. So I think there are many new ways of, we are not deciding, okay, we use this tool or Sublime or this tool for whatever we want. We can create our own editors. Multi-screen and the side content. When thinking about multi-screen, there is this minority report thing everyone is thinking of. Um, but what, I, what I try to show you is something else. Have a look at this example. It's, uh, Fabio um, says it's an iPhone infinity. It's something that just breaks the screen and continues at the side. What's interesting about this approach is that, that we might use this space for additional information that's probably not uh, needed on the main screen. So when you think of this approach and project it to something like your living room, um, you can have something like your TV showing something and your wall picture showing new fixtures for the football game currently running and the tablet showing uh, the current bet bettings or whatever. So I think there will be a time where every device is connected in real time and shows additional content based on what you're doing currently. Flat design is, is the current trend for sure, but what's beyond flat? What I see is that when you read about flat design and what's beyond flat, People are, tell, the designers tell um, that this trend might last for a while. So, but what's happening is that we, we see some small changes like perspective and the buttons up there, or shadows, slight, slight changes in, in flat design. But generally, it will stay like less, less uh, simplicity and, and flat, I think. Nick Pettit from Treehouse, um, a learning provider, um, has these four um, predictions for, for the next step after flat design. So it will be more shapes, more colors, more big photographs, or layers. And as an example for this layer approach is that one. You can see that you have the layer of the application itself, and then you have these persons up there is the second layer, and when you click a person, you have the conversation with this person. So it's not only having a modal, for example, it goes even deeper. You have different stacks um, 
a story that you click through. Diff this. Hmm. That word doesn't exist uh, as well. <laughs> but what exists is DevOps. Um, that's probably something you already heard of. And DevOps is development techniques applied to operations. So having releases, deployments, builds, testing, etc. And what I try to tell you is we can do this to design as well. So why not apply development techniques to design? What does this mean? This means we need to think about more modular design. So not only thinking in pages or templates. We need to think about modules like a navigation, a visual, a teaser, whatever element. What about design builds or automated design testing? I don't know. There are question marks. So probably you have an idea what, what's happening next. Tomorrow there is a talk from Roland Seiler of Nose about design testing. I'm really looking forward to that one. Pageless design. A trend you're currently seeing everywhere. So people are trying to design stories instead of pages and deep information architectures. It's way easier for a user to follow a story and get converted than diving into deep structures and finding and searching whatever he needs. And the cool thing as well about telling a story instead of pages is that the designer needs to think about users' needs first. So you always think about what's my conversion in this case? Is it a sign up? Is it to buy something? Is it a, a newsletter sign up or is it a sharing on a social media? You have to care about what's really what's really your need and what's the user's need. So thinking in stories is a good approach. And Nathan Weller um, made a compilation of things um, connected to, to this topic. And what I would like to tell is the efficient iteration. So about A-B testing, it's way easier to test a one pager with the whole story on it and a conversion um, to the try different variations than if you have to change the whole tree where the user do follows. That's really complex. Hmm. Who, who's working in a print agency? No one. Uh, but it, that's, that's an interesting thing. About the last few months I was at 20 agencies talking to them about my product. And there were many print agencies in there as well. And what I see currently is that print agencies are trying to become digital. So they all try to, to jump into, into the web. So what does this mean? In, on, on one side, it's, it's a huge chance for print design and for the designers working there and for front-end developers be, because they are needed everywhere. Um, but on the other side, for those who are working in a full service agency, it's, it might be a huge problem because print agencies and brand agencies are really at the source. So they are connected with the customer first before the full service agency. And if they do a good job in that, they can really get a lot of money. So I'm really, I'm really, um, yeah, I'm looking forward to what's happening here. When you read about what's, what's the biggest challenge, um, I've read a survey and uh, there were about 20 designers um, answering and almost all of them said the biggest challenge is variety. Well, the other talk is about responsive design, so I think you already heard that stuff. But uh, yeah, sure, the variety of devices, screen sizes is a huge challenge. But I think we have the tools and, um, yeah, we have the tool set to solve this problem. It's always a conceptual problem. It's a technical problem. What else? But think about if it goes even further. If we have multi-screen, if we have multiple devices that are connected to each other in real time, what happens then? So 
content is shown everywhere, uh, supporting content is shown everywhere in every size. Awesome times, we will never have to worry about work. So what, what, what can you do um, preparing yourself for all this? You have to put yourself into pole position by keeping up to date, for example. I mean, sure, you can read all the news, you can read Twitter, Y Combinator, Hacker News, um, Designer News, whatever. Um, but what's also interesting is to follow Kickstarter, for example. Because on Kickstarter, there are always really smart people thinking about a lot of projects that are probably not going to happen, but they inspire you what, what probably is worth to think about it. And maybe you have some five francs left to fund a project. I think that's a good thing. Learn and teach, I think that's the most important thing. You can learn a lot about web development in general. Keep up to date with three hours, for example, a super cool website to learn. Codecademy, the same. But there are also, um, this is a pretty new one, uh, which launched a few weeks ago. Uh, it's called Public Beta. And it's not about design and development, but it's about the topics around that, around the product, around sales, around marketing. And what I think is that you become a better designer and a better developer if you take care about what, what's around what you're building. Um, Public Beta, for example, has um, video tutorials and courses about those topics. So um, you might have a look at that one. As well, there is Clarity FM, which is a service where you can call people. You can call, for example, a marketing lead of Treehouse. You can call a designer from Podio. I don't know. You can, you can really call um, great people with super cool ideas, and you pay for half an hour, for example. You can also um, allow others to call you. So that's a really cool service. And you can try to learn from others, and you can provide your knowledge to others, and even earn money with it. Yeah, read, learn, experiment, use. Um, I think one of the biggest challenges as well is um, the variety of tools out there. I mean, you cannot even dive into every topic. That that's just takes too much time. But what you can do is to just have a look at them, follow lists like Beta List or App Vita, which are uh, mailing lists with new tools and stuff like that. And it helps you to see where it goes. Normally, when a trend comes up and is really hot, there are mostly three or four coming up. So you might have a look at them. Yeah, and the future is you. You can build all that stuff as well. And there are so much tools out there which help you to get started really, really fast and to build awesome stuff. Yeah, thank you very much. And up there, there is a little discount code for Frontify. If you want to have a look at it, um, you get it um, for a better price. And yeah, I hope you, you um, get an idea of what's coming next. And you take some links uh, to home and try some of the products I've shown. Thank you very much. I think there should be some. Yeah, any questions? Are you overloaded now? Overloaded with too much links? That was fast. Yeah, really fast. Huh? Half an hour, just always too fast. <laughs> Damn, last year as well. No questions, yeah. You mentioned uh, dev devs positions, and I was curious. I, I notice a lot when people put out calls for front end developers, they're looking for JavaScript developers specifically. Sometimes you see people looking for front end developers with a bit of a design bent, but there's still a great need for there to be a lot of JavaScript uh, knowledge there. How do you see dev devs roles uh, fulfilling that need in the future? Like, 
is training going to be an obstacle? Or will people accept that there may be people with uh, front-end development skills who can't build a JavaScript framework from scratch? Yeah, that's, um, that's an interesting question. I think uh, it, it's, a, it's a, huge, a huge discussion out there uh, if designers need to start coding and developers need to do some kinds of design in terms of front-end style guides, for example. But I think you cannot say it in general. If I mean, there are designers out there who are willing to learn uh, maybe markup and CSS, but the JavaScript part is normally something that you need some more development background, which needs some more developers. This might be because uh, uh, there will be more JavaScript developers needed in the future. But uh, I, I, can't, I can't really tell you where this is heading to. But I think every, every role who is uh, connected to front-end development in general will be, will be needed in the future. Because in Switzerland, for example, you can see a huge problem. There's way too less people doing front-end. And I think in Germany, as I talked to Hans Christian, there's the same. There's a, all over. And every agency I visited would love to get more front-end engineers. So we should try to either bring designers closer to front-end development or try to teach more and create more front-end developers. I don't know if it, this answers your question. A little bit. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, other questions? Julie. Hi. Um, I was at your talk last year when you presented your product, which is now called Frontify. And um, last year, you talked about using it to help designers and developers work better together. And right now, or today, you're talking a lot about agencies. Um, has that changed in terms of how that relationship works? With designers and developers, you're actually targeting their employer as opposed to designers and developers themselves? Or um, are you targeting agencies because it's mostly agencies who are providing you know, front-end services to companies? Or I'm actually just making a run-on sentence now, so I'll stop. <laughs> well, uh, well, for my product, it's actually, the problem is actually really existing and real in agencies. And it's, it's really, um, every agency nearly knows the problem. Um, when it comes to, um, for example, enterprise segment, where they have internal, um, internal teams who are working on stuff, um, they're normally not even there to really think about real front-end development. So um, currently, the agencies are really close to the problem, and they, they know the problem, and they're trying to solve it now. Um, but it definitely is a problem in other areas as well. So when it comes to classical software engineering, um, yeah, I think the problem is all over. And I'm, I'm still thinking that the only way to, to solve the problem is to provide a platform where they can work together. So where they can, uh, Hans Christian talked about style guides. I mean, I think that the only way is that we have like a, a living document where something comes from the designer and something comes from the developer. And it's not really defined who provides what. So maybe you have a designer who is really familiar with HTML. So he can provide the design and the HTML. And the developer makes the rest. Or you have a designer who is only capable to design. So the, des the developer makes the rest. But what's always the same is the end result. You always work on the same product on the same living uh, style guide. Um, I think that's the way to go. And I'm trying to evangelism this, uh, this topic all over. Yeah. Any other question? We got a question uh, from Twitter on Krasimir Zonev. What is your opinion about preprocess uh, preprocessors, JS and CSS? Do you think that they will be used in the future? Yeah, that's another super, super hard discussion because uh, you know, there are many, many different uh, opinions on that. My personal opinion is that 
SAS and, C and LAS are very cool things, but they are dangerous. So what I like about them is that we can solve some real problems like having variables for something like colors, font definitions. So variables is for me is very important stuff. And what's also important is to solve this whole prefixing stuff to, to, to create mix-ins for that. But what's a problem, I think, I'm not really a huge fan of all this nesting stuff where you nest everything and you create this complexity. I'm a huge fan of simplicity. And I think it's way more important to keep something readable, um, maintainable, and especially readable by maybe poorly skilled people as well. You, you don't have only experts in your team. You have to care about the others as well. If you have a team of 10, 15 people, everyone needs to understand. No one has time to, to learn half a day uh, how this works and what you have thought about the architecture of your CSS. So I think you should, you should be a little bit, um, yeah, you should just use what you really need and what really solves a problem. Don't try to over-engineer stuff just because it's possible. Yeah, that's my opinion. Any other opinions on that one? <laughs> For sure. Other questions? Anyone? Everyone sleeping? The lunch was good. <laughs> All right. Where do you see one? Ah, oh, here. <laughs> All right. So this question is from Mike. Um, what's the one thing that you would need to design and develop twice as fast as today within the next six months? What? <laughs> All right, let's try that again. What is the one thing that you would need to design and develop twice as fast as today in the next six months? Whew. Hard question. Whew. Um, well, for me personally, I'm working on a product, so it's um, <laughs> it's always uh, yeah. It's I'm I'm currently working on 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 thinking on iOS stuff and and OS X stuff. So <laughs> hopefully this kind of stuff gets easier. So for me, currently, I would love to see um, everything I can develop to be as easy as front-end development. And as accessible and not with that much, you know, hurdles. Because I don't understand why I have to learn this kind of objective C stuff. And uh, I just want to draw, you know, a little box with borders and buttons and stuff like that. Things we can do in the web, like in, yeah, in a second. So for me, it's more other technologies that are hard to access and hard to jump into. And I would love to see everything as easy as the web. No question, we have five minutes left, I'll show you something. <laughs> <laughs> Yay, no internet. But I can start something for myself. I have my internet on the machine. So what I can show you is, uh, this is Frontify. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, no, the cool thing about it is that you can generate something like uh, this. It's a, a little bit big here, but yeah, you might see it. Um, 
Hans Christian talked about it today. And the main idea of it is to allow um, a designer to easily specify things like colors, where you can just click on something and it generates you um, a definition like here, it's pickled blue wood or zest or whatever color you want. And it saves it in a structured way, as well as like measures and grids were really easy to create um, like this or like that. You can also create modules like um, you can uh, create your front end structure within the tool. You don't have to draw it on a paper. You can share it with your team really easily. And you can, um, you can uh, add annotations, for example, to, to show others what you mean in an interaction. And what's resulting out of uh, definitions within Frontify is a style guide. And the style guide allows you to have something shareable, with allows you to export code, to see the grid, um, to see all the text definitions, typography stuff, all the modules. You can even type in your markup directly in here. So that's the thing I told before. The, when a designer creates a design, the developer can jump in, go to the module, add his markup, and then it's, it's already ready for the backend engineers who want to integrate it. And it goes even further if you click on something um, I need to hack a little bit because this is uh, how does it work? I know I don't know it myself. Ah, so like this. For example, uh, you know Copen. Um, what I'm trying to do is a little experiment where I just put in a design on the left side and the developed area on the right side. And then you have the markup here and the CSS there. And you can uh, just um, edit it in real time. That's not really yeah, just an experiment, but if you, can, if you think of it as a future editor where it allows you to really work focused on a specific module, have everything available, specifications for it, everything, um, I think you can save a lot of time. So that's what I wanted to show you. Thanks. Thank, thank you, Roger. Um, we'll have a quick break, 15 minutes, and then we'll go further on with uh, gearing up for Google Glass development. Thank you. Keine Ahnung. <lacht>